The Central Intelligence Agency has been a core part of the United States' defense against foreign and domestic enemies for decades. However, it has attracted plenty of criticism for its methods and motives over the years. Declassified documents have only fueled this criticism, revealing all manner of unethical or illegal conduct hidden in the CIA's closet. Many of the declassified secrets are more absurd than creepy. Wacky plots and absurd technology like bird spy drones, catfish spy drones, dragonfly spy drones, a lot of animal spy drones come to think of it, are among the stranger revelations from declassified archives. However, some of these documents reveal far more gruesome secrets. Plans for political assassinations, mind control, torture, and even inciting international wars reveal that the CIA has gotten up to far more than the public ever suspected. Today, we look at some of the darkest secrets of the CIA that were exposed thanks to declassified documents. If you enjoy videos like this, don't forget to like and subscribe to support us and keep updated on future content. The CIA has a long-standing reputation for being involved in assassination and targeted killings of its enemies. Often, the political consequences of these killings are controversial enough, but they also show the creativity with which the CIA searched for gruesome ways to kill people. In 2007, a collection of documents nicknamed the Family Jewels were declassified. Originally compiled in the 1970s, these documents detailed the CIA's involvement in numerous assassination plots throughout the Cold War. Although some details had trickled out in previous decades, the 2007 declassification finally gave a full picture. The former dictator of Cuba, Fidel Castro, might have been the single most targeted person by the CIA. These documents revealed how, over the years, the CIA came up with countless plots to kill him in ever more elaborate ways. One plan was to lace a box of Castro's favorite brand of cigars with a powerful toxin. This plan was implemented, but although the cigars were delivered to an agent, it's not known what happened to them. He is hoping no one else tried to smoke them. In another plot, the CIA reached out to the boss of the Chicago mob, Sam Giancana, who had operations in Cuba. Giancana worked with the CIA and suggested introducing poison pills to Castro's food, but after several unsuccessful attempts, the plan was abandoned. Other bizarre plans to kill him with a hypodermic needle hidden in a pen were scuttled due to JFK's assassination in 1963, and another plan to hide a bomb in a seashell was dismissed as impractical. Another target of CIA assassins was the first Prime Minister of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Patrice Lumumba. Lumumba was suspected of having pro-communist views, suspicions which were intensified when he sought Soviet aid to deal with rebels in 1960. Documents show that the CIA suggested several plans to kill Lumumba, including poisoning his toothbrush, although none of these plans were known to be implemented. Later allegations from former CIA operatives claim that the CIA was involved in his eventual deposition and execution by rival Congolese groups, but concrete evidence for these claims are yet to be found. Perhaps the most bizarre yet gruesome assassination method suggested by the CIA was an artificial lightning weapon. This odd weapon was hypothesized in a document dating from the 1960s from an anonymous meteorologist. The plan was to use long thin wires suspended from a plane or a rocket that would fly into storms and conduct the electrical charge via the wires towards targets of interest. This could be an individual, equipment, or infrastructure. The documents mention the ability of lightning to burn holes in fuel tanks and damage the propellers of aircraft, but it also indicates that such a weapon would allow the CIA to assassinate targets without leaving any evidence of their involvement. The ludicrous plan was never implemented, at least to our knowledge, but it shows the lengths the CIA went to in order to find new ways to kill people. MKUltra is one of the most infamous and terrifying CIA projects that only came to light years after events had taken place. 
In 1974, New York Times journalist Seymour Hersh published claims that the CIA had been running non-consensual drug experiments on American citizens. This prompted President Gerald Ford to launch a commission to investigate these claims. The Rockefeller Commission, named for its head Vice President Nelson Rockefeller, and later a Senate committee now known as the Church Committee, uncovered piles of dirty laundry buried by the CIA. But worst of all was MKUltra. MKUltra was the code name for CIA research into mind control techniques that took place throughout the 1950s and 1960s. After the Second World War, the CIA became convinced that the Soviets had developed a method of mind control. With the Cold War well underway, the CIA insisted that they had to develop their own mind control program to match the alleged Soviet version. To this end, the CIA tapped the chemist Sidney Gottlieb to lead a project to develop mind control methods. Gottlieb was given immense resources and minimal oversight in his quest to develop these techniques. One of the most abominable resources that Gottlieb had access to were former Nazi and Japanese scientists, as part of the United States' wider Operation Paperclip, which aimed to grab former Axis scientists to aid America in the Cold War arms race. Nazis, who had participated in the concentration camps, especially Dachau, where mind control experiments had been attempted on Holocaust victims, became part of the project. MK Ultra's goals and staff were grim enough, but their methods were the most gruesome part. Gottlieb broke the mind control process into two parts. The first was to break the subject's existing mental state, and the second was to implement a new mental state to serve the project's ends. MKUltra never made much progress on the second, but they found all sorts of cruel ways to implement the first. Drugs, physical violence, and electroshock torture all played a part as Gottlieb and his team attempted to break and remake the human mind. LSD, methamphetamine, heroin, and MDMA were particular substances of interest to MKUltra. The project began secretly undertaking experiments at universities, prisons, hospitals, and other institutions across the United States and the world. Subjects were given these drugs, often against their consent or full knowledge, to measure the effects. These experiments were deeply unethical, and subjects could be left physically or mentally damaged by the experience. Gottlieb experimented on American prisoners, or even captured Soviet agents. They also trapped members of the public, such as through Operation Midnight Climax, where the CIA used prostitutes to lure men so that they could be forcibly drugged to measure the effects of the substances. Many of those subjected to these experiments would suffer life-changing consequences. James Whitey Bulger, an infamous Boston mob boss, revealed that he had been subject to LSD experiments against his consent from the CIA during the Cold War. Bulger described how he knew he was being experimented upon, but could not do anything to stop it. Bulger would go on to a life of crime in Boston's mob, for which he would eventually be arrested, charged, and imprisoned. However, upon learning of the MK Ultra experiments, some experts and even jurors argued that these experiments might explain Bulger's later life of crime. Another victim of the MK Ultra experiments was one Theodore Kaczynski, then a promising Harvard math student, but who would later become known as the Unabomber, killing and injuring dozens of people in a slew of bombing campaigns in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Many believed that the MK Ultra experiments played a role in Kaczynski's descent into violent extremism. One CIA scientist named Frank Olson was secretly dosed with LSD by Gottlieb personally at a party in 1953. Several days later, he committed suicide by throwing himself from a window at his New York hotel room. Family and colleagues reported that Olson had been acting oddly since the party, and the unusual circumstances of his death has led many to argue that he was killed in order to keep MK Ultra a secret. Others argue that Olsen had knowledge of other CIA secrets, and this had been a test run of MKUltra to see if it could be used to get Olsen to confess what he knew before he was eliminated. We may never know the truth, but in 1976, the CIA did reach a wrongful death settlement with Olsen's family, acknowledging that they played some role in his death. MKUltra came to an end in the early 1970s. A lack of results and changing leadership in the CIA meant that the project fizzled out. 
Before he left, Gottlieb attempted to destroy many of the records relating to the project. And indeed, he succeeded in destroying thousands of records. It was only because of other records scattered across CIA archives that the Rockefeller Commission and the Church Committee could learn about the crimes committed by the project. However, Gottlieb never faced any consequences for his actions, and to this day, no one involved with MKUltra was ever held accountable for their actions. In the wake of the 9-11 terrorist attacks, the CIA played a key role in the war on terror against extremist threats to the United States and its allies. Intelligence gathering was an essential aspect of this role, but there was much concern over how the CIA went about this. A report released in 2004 under the Bush administration and re-released with fewer redactions during the Obama administration detailed a long list of abuses towards prisoners in CIA captivity. The CIA employed illegal torture techniques, which it dubbed enhanced interrogation techniques, to extract confessions and evidence, especially from Al-Qaeda prisoners. Whether one believes these methods were justified or not is one matter, but there is no denying that these methods were gruesome and it's no wonder that the CIA was reluctant to have them exposed. Waterboarding was by far the most talked about revelation from this report. Waterboarding involves restraining a captive, covering their mouth with a rag and then pouring water over them. This makes the captive feel like they are drowning. Waterboarding can be fatal, but usually the goal is to induce terror and bring people somewhat close to blacking out from oxygen deprivation before interrogating them further. Waterboarding is widely considered to be a form of torture and therefore illegal. The CIA was known to have used the technique on a number of prisoners, which became an issue of national and global controversy. Many condemned the practice as barbaric, while others claimed that it was justified given the nature of the prisoners. In the wake of 9-11 and wars in the Middle East, that argument resonated with many. Waterboarding was merely one of many unethical methods used by CIA agents. Prisoners were threatened with firearms and power tools and told that these tools would be used on them unless they gave up information. This method was aided by mock executions of fellow prisoners. Someone, usually another CIA agent, would be dressed up as a prisoner and covered with a hood. The actual prisoner would be inside a room and then hear a gunshot outside. They would be taken outside to see the fake prisoner lying in a fake pool of blood, as if they had just been executed, threatening the actual prisoner with the same fate if they didn't comply. Other known methods were sleep deprivation and leaving prisoners in freezing cold rooms to break down their mental resistance. The report also mentioned psychological torture techniques, such as threatening to kill a prisoner's family members, which were especially employed by CIA agents operating in the Middle East. On one occasion, a CIA interrogator was recorded telling a prisoner, we could get your mother in here. Another warned a prisoner that we're going to kill your children. These revelations caused a significant backlash domestically and internationally. Barack Obama made the reports a central argument for his promise to close the Guantanamo Bay Detention Center, where many of these abuses had taken place, although he never went through with the plan to shut it down. Much like other exposed CIA abuses, no one has ever faced legal consequences for the actions in the published documents, and it's unlikely that anyone ever will. In 1992, the John F. Kennedy Assassination Records Collection Act saw the declassification of thousands of records from the JFK administration. However, it took several years for public attention to settle on a series of documents, among these which detailed Operation Northwoods. This project would soon become one of the CIA's most infamous plans. Operation Northwoods was a multi-department proposal involving the CIA and the Joint Chiefs of Staff which was put before President Kennedy in 1962. Its goal was to place the United States in the apparent position of suffering defensible grievances against Cuba that could be used as a justification for war. Castro's communist Cuba was a point of contention for the US, who feared a communist nation so close to its borders. Operation Northwoods called for CIA operatives to take the lead in staging false flag attacks on American and Cuban citizens in order to frame the Cuban government and create a pretext for war. 
These included bombings, assassinations, and sabotage against civilian populations. As part of the proposal, the US would sink Cuban refugee ships attempting to reach Florida and blame it on Castro. They also suggested launching a campaign of terrorist attacks targeting Cuban refugee communities across the US. The US base at Guantanamo Bay was a particular area of interest. The Northwoods documents contain elaborate plans to stage a false flag attack on the base, with fake rioters and saboteurs to sell the deception. The crowning moment of this false campaign would be the destruction of a US ship in or near the harbor. The paper cites the destruction of the USS Maine, which drew the US into the Spanish-American War in 1889 as a precedent. Alternatively, an unmanned ship could be blown up near Cuban waters. The plan proposed staging a fake evacuation of a non-existent crew with US fighters, and publishing fake casualty lists in newspapers to generate public outrage. The documents also contained a number of suggestions for staging the destruction of aircraft, to be blamed on Cuba. One plan was for the CIA to register a civilian aircraft and fill it with agents pretending to be a group of college students off on a holiday or any groupings of persons with a common interest to support chartering a non-scheduled flight. This plane would take off from somewhere in the US, but then divert to Florida. There it would be replaced by a remotely flown plane that would fly near Cuban airspace, issue a mayday signal, and then be remotely destroyed. The plan was for non-American sources to hear the mayday signal first, so that it could look like the US was just as surprised as anyone else, rather than the US announcing the destruction itself and inviting suspicion. Alternatively, the Northwoods plan suggested downing a military aircraft. The pilot would then be told to fake a distress signal before landing at a secret base, where his identity and plane identification numbers could be changed. A submarine would then deposit plane wreckage in the area. An investigation would be launched for the supposedly missing plane, only to find plane parts floating in the area. The Joint Chiefs of Staff for the JFK administration all approved this plan. It was JFK himself who vetoed it. JFK even replaced the Chairman of the Chiefs of Staff after the plan was proposed, suggesting he was deeply unhappy with the idea. Top military and intelligence officials took this as a sign that JFK was going soft on Cuba, and a rift opened up between an increasingly conciliatory JFK and the hardline hawkish military leadership. Of course, this was cut short with JFK's assassination in November 1963. Whether Kennedy's rift with military and intelligence officials had anything to do with that fateful day remains an open question. The CIA continues to operate and who knows what secret might be revealed in the coming years. We can only hope that they have learned from their mistakes and that the current members are as disturbed by these revelations as we are. We hope that you have enjoyed this video. Remember to like and subscribe for more content like this, and we'll see you in the next video, assuming that the CIA doesn't pay us a visit first.